Hello, this is Clara, and you can call me Mother, and welcome to another episode of the Utani Livestream. Today, I've got joining me uh, Michael Scuderi from Ash, a fan fiction comic, also known as Hyperdyne. Hi, Mike. Hello. <laughs> and I've also got uh, Connor Colson from Prometheus by Minute, also known as Android. Hello, Connor. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, how exciting. It's really great to have everyone back again. Unfortunately, um, other Mike, Mike Andrews, couldn't make it because he is suffering from strep throat. So all the best to him in his recovery. So He's today- He's got an ovipositor down his throat, really. <laughs> I visited yeah. him earlier. That's totally it. <laughs> <laughs> and it spins me out that I do not know, um, what is it? the the United States as well as I thought I did because I didn't realize that you two live so close to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Um, so uh, just before we get started talking about Blade Runner 2049, which is what we're going to do today, I just wanted to thank our Patreon supporters. So I want to give a big shout out to our longest supporter, Sarah Hall, our highest pledge and highest lifetime pledger, Lady Anne. And uh, the rest of the uh, Patreon supporters, as such as Michael Andrews, Sarah, uh, Sarah Hall, of course, and Lady Anne, Benjamin Scottford, Project Asheron, Zachary Rice, Daniel Cooper, JB, Zeno Park, and Georgina Gray. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So, Blade Runner 2049, what are your thoughts? That's big vague question <laughs> oh, what do you think about it as a, as a follow-up to the original Blade Runner um, with Dena, Denis Villeneuve directing and Denis Ridley Villeneuve? Scott producing <laughs> yeah I had to what he, he did the introductions for the short the, the sort of promotional short films that they had before leading up to the film and yeah I really paid attention to how I said, hello, I am Denny Villeneuve. Oh, oh, that's how you say it, right. <laughs> Not Dennis Villeneuve. Um, so, uh, I actually think it's better than the original Blade Runner. I would go that far. It's not only a fitting sequel, but in some ways it's superior. And it's not a surprise because Denny, I love everything he's done. Even... Um, some of his smaller films that people might not be aware of. There's one called uh, Prisoner, which is Jake Gyllenhaal and Hugh Jackman. And, oh, my God, it's a smaller budget production, but it's so intense. I have so much trouble with Jake Gyllenhaal, poor man's Tobey Maguire, <laughs> who is already a poor man's man. version of himself. <laughs> Uh, I love him. No, no, no. That's all right. He's, I mean, where is Tobey Maguire nowadays? Exactly. Jake Gyllenhaal won. <laughs> yeah. He, t he took over. He is, he's both of them now. Because I could imagine, especially in uh, the recent Velvet Buzzsaw, that could have been a role for Tobey Maguire. Yeah? Yeah, it's definitely this sort of eccentric art critic Absolutely yeah, especially with it, the way his hair has been like kind of like flattened down over his face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still have to watch that show. I can't watch horror in front of my kids anymore, uh, except for Alien. Oh, They're fine one... with Alien. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's some quite gruesome scenes in that one. Alien's more of a romance for people like us, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> It is. It's it's when one life form finds another life form and has a baby. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to 2049. Um, one of the initial things that you've just mentioned, which is all of the short films leading up to it, uh, I really enjoyed the way that they've kind of let different directors take the helm in bringing to life the world of 2049 or the lead up to it and all three of them were so well done yeah they felt really connected i, I had a problem mm. with the animated short because of the way the character the voice actors were um it seemed very as if they did translate the scripts directly from japanese to english 
<laughs> so it didn't feel very... I kind of liked that. Really? Uncanniness. Yeah. yeah. It, it felt more authentic, like we're just it, it did feel like an in anime. on this anime from the future. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed um, uh, Nowhere to Run. I think I think that was one of the best mm. because uh, so, warning to everyone if you haven't watched Blade Runner twenty forty nine stop listening and watching to this podcast right now because we are going to cover spoilers. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, what are you doing listening to this <laughs> podcast if you haven't seen the movie yet? Yeah, Get go watch the movie, the come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was really great to have that little tidbit about Stafford Morton. I felt so much more for him than I felt like I would have initially done so yeah. if i just watched the movie because he was just just so expendable as a character but it made him so much more deeper to me having watched the short first how about and I you love guys batista and it's so great to <laughs> see him really getting to act and uh he he really is able to deliver a character who's complex who's you know this sort of he looks like this big brute but he's actually really kind and complex and mm. well read and uh, i hope we well, you know with the whole james gunn controversy i don't know if we're going to see drax again but if not maybe dc needs a new bane <laughs> he would make a great bane. yeah yeah totally yeah because yeah, bane is that kind of character who is much more complex than, well, especially the the, the hmm. uh, Schumacher depiction would have you believe. <laughs> <laughs> rah, 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 rah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, yeah, I mean, Tom Hardy, yeah, I mean, they get some elements right. But this isn't about Bane. I could talk about Bane a lot, but <laughs> let's stay on track. <laughs> we could do that in another podcast. It's okay. <laughs> Bane runner. We can talk about other <laughs> other fandoms and other characters we can we admire or identify with. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, in in terms of the shorts, uh, what did you find um, the best parts in them to interlink with the movie? No <laughs> Blade Runner twenty forty nine pun intended. <laughs> interlinked. <laughs> I I actually I'm quite fascinated by Wallace. I seem to be drawn to characters like that. You know, you've got Wayland. And um, you don't see too much of, um, uh, uh, oh, God, blanking on the name now. Tyrell. Uh, Tyrell, thank you, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and and Kamsky from Detroit, those sort of, these men who are playing gods with science. Uh, and obviously I love Frankenstein as well. There's just, especially Wallace kind of builds himself up as this very removed deity and you definitely see that in his short i I actually i have mixed feelings about um oh great man i'm just not good with words this morning bloody hell i even follow him on instagram but um who plays wallace i'm just uh, i know i was actually just looking up his name myself because jared 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 leto Leto. (laughs) i was gonna wait wait for you guys to uh come up with it but yeah well. <laughs> it's fine i have a, a disease that makes my brain inflamed so you can't be mean to me <laughs> <laughs> yes but yeah so jared well so it can he's be got the inflamed brain right now don't say anything <laughs> about it <laughs> um but yeah so it, it can be leto or leto so it's a greek name and uh originally it was leto in the original Greek pronunciation, but um, American pronunciation has shifted it to Leto, so um, you're technically you're right both ways is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, I, I think I've got uh, mixed feelings about him. He can be a bit pretentious. He does some things that are a bit questionable to his co-hosts and crew members. But um, <laughs> the performance. Are you is... talking about Jared Leto or? Yes, yeah. Jared Leto okay. uh, All right. on the set of Suicide Squad, but yeah, yeah, I, I really that. think <laughs> he delivers some great performances. I liked his Joker. I like Wallace, um, and even though he's not in the film that much, I, he definitely leaves an impact. Oh, in both of those movies, I have to say, you know, um, I came into this movie knowing Jared Leto was going to be in it, and it was the one thing. I was really disappointed by, um, and then when I found out who was originally going to play Jared Leto's part in this film, 
I was doubly disappointed because I am a huge David Bowie fan. And if David oh. Bowie had originally not died, <laughs> stupid bastard. <laughs> and if that's selfish come in, had chosen to die at that I know. Time. I would kill him if he weren't dead already. <laughs> um, I mean, imagine all of the scenes with Wallace. Imagine your favorite scene with Wallace, with David Bowie playing it. It would have been out of this world. I think... The, the it would have been where, out of this world. Uh, where Wallace executes the um, the replicant as soon as uh, she comes out is mm. just so full on. Like imagining Bowie doing that, I'd be like, "That's intense." <laughs> yeah, it would. I, it would be really intense because he's an older man. You, t- I, I'm sorry, Jared Leto is. There is nothing imposing about him to me. I, I feel like I'm watching an actor act when I watch him. He's not a bad actor, but it's his style. His style gets in the way of his uh, my suspension of disbelief. Yeah. I, I just feel like I'm watching an actor. <laughs> yeah, I don't like his voice be. in 2049. I don't like the way he poises himself. Nothing about him was believable to me. Yeah, he's definitely one of those. He's, he's doing the method acting. He's, he's trying his best. Bless him. But Is he um, a method actor? Oh, he, yeah, he definitely, if you've heard the stories about the stuff behind the scenes, he, he goes a God. little bit too deep into the roles. But, um... Yeah, he sent yeah, a dead rat to a, to a co-actor yeah. as a sign of love. <laughs> as Joker. And I appreciate that comment. <laughs> I feel Dork. like it actually works for Wallace. It's almost like... Um, a bit of a Kylo Ren thing or um, mm. just that idea of he has to build himself up because the Tyrell Corporation had this legacy and see Tyrell was I never felt like he was trying hard he felt pretty mm. comfortable in his skin he, he knew who he was uh, whereas yeah I think Wallace is definitely he he, he, he doesn't even speak he, he just recites his own poetry is what I'm assuming <laughs> mm, that's a good way of putting it. He he's definitely a he's made himself this theatrical mm. veneer. He's he's artifice. He there's nothing sincere about that character, and I think that's actually oh that's that actually segues nicely into the the main themes of 2049 is what is real, what is truth, and I think that's part of the reason why I think 2049 is more relevant to issues of the modern day than the original Blade Runner was. Um, that we are living in a world of, you know, when we're making friends online, we can create these images and uh, alternate identities. We're interacting with AI more and more. We've got, uh, yeah, VR. We've got potentially more sophisticated machines taking over the workforce, entering our homes, all that sort of stuff. And so those discussions of what is real, that's, mm. that's why I come back to this movie over and over again. Um, I'm especially intrigued by those ideas of, I think human beings would feel more comfortable being intimate with something like joy. Mm. But what does that do to us as a people? Um, in Detroit, they, in the magazines that you can pick up and read they talk about how kids these days aren't learning manners and stuff because they can just order an android to do something they're not learning negotiation Mm. they're not learning manners they're not learning empathy Mm. so there's that argument that well joy she won't talk back so there is this sort of it seems like heaven but there can be this darker underside or or at least a consequence to such a perfect relationship humans aren't meant for perfection we're not meant to be perfect we're not meant to be in a perfect world we reject it Mm. Mm. and this ladies and gentlemen is why you go and check out prometheus by a minute (laughs) (laughs) because this guy is fantastic at oh, wrapping thanks. around, he'll you will go around the block, but you'll hit all the important points all along the way. And you always make <laughs> oh, yeah. a great case for your opinion. No, no, it's great. It's, I love listening to your discussions. Your episodes, at the same time, are also very short, or they feel really short to me. You, yeah. you cover so much ground in so 
such a, a compact amount of time. Yeah, it's very it's concise. It's always great. <laughs> yeah, oh, which, great. geez, I could, I could use a little bit of that myself. <laughs> it comes from, I did three years of a librarianship degree. Maybe I'll finish that one day, but ah. <laughs> writing so many essays it and also listening to a lot of other uh, critics and other mm. movies by minutes, I just realized, okay, so in this minute, I've got four points I want to make, and then I have to sort of bridge them together. And that's the fun part, is sewing them together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting to the point I can do that on the fly. I, that's I good. can make segues live. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i have to i gotta get there what is it librarian degree yeah like what is it uh, and archiving i'm doing it very android set tasks i think <laughs> absolutely <laughs> that's great um what is so this i'm surrounded by uh, androids <laughs> you're an android <laughs> almost almost a, <laughs> almost a space balls reference yeah <laughs> very close um, uh, in terms of uh, new characters, uh, because we've of course got Deckard and we have um, Rachel come in uh, later on in, in the movie, uh, which characters do you feel the most connection to in, in the new film? Is it Kay? Is it Joy? Is it... Uh... <laughs> Any of the um, I, other side characters? You know, it's it's quite rare for the main character to be the one you relate to because generally your protagonist is kind of generic. They've got to be to be a, a point of view. Mm. But Kay is very compelling to me because of the journey he goes through and that... For me, I, I'm so bored of the old trope of, well, there's the Pinocchio syndrome or complex where the robot wants to be a real boy uh, or other people are demanding this android become human or be something that they're not. And Kay, the, and you can interpret it as, oh, he, he's horrified to learn that he should have been, you know, he, he's human and he should have led a normal life, but I don't read it that way. I, I see him as being content with being a replicant, and so that idea of him being human is horrifying to him in a different way, that he doesn't, he doesn't seem to want that. It's almost as if, like when he finds out that uh, Deckard actually had a daughter, he kind of resigns himself to it. It's almost a relief. That's how I read it. Mm. Mm, that's interesting. I hadn't considered it that way before. How about you, Hadadine? I... Oh, sorry. I noticed that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I was just going to say, I noticed that um, Ryan Gosling does play a lot of kind of autistic characters, like in, in this and also in Drive and a few of his other roles. He's very... He doesn't. He doesn't say much... He's not good at small talk. There's sort of this social... He's not awkward. It's just this aloofness or, or he's uncomfortable. And I, I, he's very good at it. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, he... Uh, I thought he his performance in Blade Runner 2049 was strengthened by how subdued it was that uh, really reinforced not only the feeling, you know, bringing us back to the, the feeling of the original film and early Ridley Scott, but um, it gave his character more impact too. Um, just as, uh, you know, being a, a replicant and everything, um, you know, the replicants we've, er, we've seen are all indistinguishable from humans and to see such a subdued performance, this was a unique thing for this universe actually. And he really nailed it. I wasn't sure what to expect with him going into the film but I was immediately thinking yeah this was the right guy because they could have gotten Jared Leto <laughs> that's always the risk uh, <laughs> or Chris Pratt being cast in everything oh my god <laughs> get him <laughs> out of here already Tom even in Jurassic Park I'm like get him out of here <laughs> um, yeah, yeah uh, I but I think that's what 
that he stands on his own that it just made me think that all of this this film this production it, it stands on its own mm-hmm. and i mean it feels very much a part of the same universe just decades forward but it's incredible to me that the soundtrack the vid- visuals the everything about it the, the tone it's familiar but not too familiar, but not too not familiar to mm-hmm. quote the Mabim Bam intro. But it, yeah, that's and also ha, there's somehow the both Blade Runners. They're not action-packed, fast-paced films for the most part, and yet I keep coming back to them. There's something so it, it it's like a dream. There's something kind of mesmeric about the experience. Mm. More smoke. We need more smoke. <laughs> there is a uniform, a uniform amount of smoke on the set. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm. All right, it's Dan O'Bannon. It's time to with the pressure. <laughs> That's like my favorite thing. I was gonna say, you know, and you're really on to something there, Connor. Um, something that me that I wondered for years and years because I've I've. Blade Runner is as old as I am, and I don't remember the first time I saw it, but um, I always wondered, it's such a rich universe, and they've gone crazy with Alien, they've gone crazy with Star Wars to the point where they've made great films, and they've gone to the point where they've exhausted all the ideas, and then they reinvent the whole series and bring it back, and uh, Blade Runner has had one film, they've had a couple of... uh, you know, novel sequels and stuff like that, Replicant Night and everything. But um, I think what they were trying to avoid was somebody just revisiting the universe and not having a, a good enough, you know, a story that stands up to the original. Because you're following, you're not just following Ridley Scott and Hampton Fancher, you're following uh, um, Philip K. Dick as well. You know, his DNA is in there. Mm. As as different as the film is from the original, from the source material, his DNA is definitely in there, and it says a lot of the same things. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think this this was a story worth telling, and I was really skeptical of it until some of the uh, press was coming out for it before it arrived, and it was either Ridley Scott or Hampton Fancher who was saying yes, this film has a reason to exist. It's like they were reading a lot of our minds where we were like, yeah, but why a sequel to Blade Runner where there's more story to tell? Or are we just, you know, saying, oh, what haven't we done yet? Oh, we already did a thing prequel. Let's do a Blade Runner sequel or prequel or something. Yeah, but I this had that story same was feeling. totally worth telling. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had that same feeling of, Blade Runner? Really? Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Where do you go from there? But no, it turns out that it is quite a rich world, and well, you see that in the the shorts leading up to the film itself is mm-hmm. it, it doesn't even have to be like a huge like Star Wars or Star Trek universe. No, world building no. is all about, or can be, all about character. I mean, look at something like. Game of Thrones. Yes, there is the 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 more literal world building of um, you know the the cities and the maps and mm. the, the history and the lore and all of that stuff. But ultimately, or at least what I come back to is the characters, and that all those yeah, characters yeah. seem to feel like they're inhabiting a rich world. They've got a backstory and all this complicated stuff going on, and in Blade Runner especially 2049, I get that impression from pretty much every character, even Joy, I I keep thinking sure. about her and going, well, how does she work and how does she comprehend the world? I'm, I'm very fascinated by that, how AI, I would love to write a, a novel about this, just from the perspective of an android or an AI, how they reason and perceive the world. Mm. Check out my album. It's called Dust 3. There's a song called If I Were You. It's from the point of view of an android looking at humanity. I explore a little bit of that there. Nice. Yes, I have, awesome. <laughs> uh, I, My entire third album is based on like 
all this kind of stuff. But anyway. Yeah, sorry. Drop a link Shameless in the chat. self promotion. <laughs> yeah, chuck a link in the chat for it. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll have to do that. Yeah. But I think you're, again, you're really onto something there with the, the architecture of these stories really being the characters and, and not the locations and cinematography and all of the uniform amounts of smoke and <laughs> everything. You know, it's, it isn't just the atmosphere, whereas, you know, Blade Runner is drenched in noir and you know ridley early ridley scottness and, and everything you know but it is it's the characters even just re-watching the original film last week i was thinking god you know these characters there's so much to them and it led me to my whole rant last week about um how many layers there are to that film and how how you watch the movie from each character's perspective and there's so much to see in it, you know, under the hood. There's so much going on. Um, and that's why it's really stood the test of time. A lot of Ridley's movies do that, too. Mm. You know, it's, much I think of a it's the themes as well. Uh, it's just, oh, it's sure. Yeah, but the yeah, themes okay. of his films, you know, Alien, it's about um, sexual anxiety and reproduction and all those sorts mm -hmm. of things, which are universal. They are timeless concepts. And Blade Runner, well, the first one, it's, you know, this is sort of a, it's, it's still in the, the analog age. So questions of what is real and, and all of that is more, I think the first one's asking those questions more in terms of what do we define as humanity? Mm -hmm. And I think Blade Runner 2049 doesn't ask about humanity so much as it asks about reality. It's asking what do we want yeah, to construct yeah. as our reality and what do we give, uh, what, what, how do you apply that sort of animism or anthropomorphism? Mm. You know, how, how much should we care about Joy's welfare? How much should we care about any of the other replicants? And those questions, oh, and also questions of, um, you know, class divides, and it seems humanity always has to have, uh, mm -hmm. if not a literal slave class, but just, you know, a lower class to control. I think all of those questions right now are more relevant than ever, but they're also universal. Mm. Absolutely, yeah, that's really, really well put. Absolutely, yeah. I, I would have to 100% agree, and that's part of the strength of why this film stands on its own it's not asking those same freaking questions which is where sometimes i kind of feel like prometheus and covenant are they're asking the questions in new ways at least which is good but i feel like you know ridley scott has not put down chariots of the gods since 1966 or whenever it came out he's still book writing movies according ridiculous. to that book it is ridiculous <laughs> i loved it as a kid but I put it down at some point. Ridley Scott, I think, you know, he's just fascinated with it. And the thing is, you know, we've all, you know, like, Connor, how old are you? I am 27. So there you go. You know, you've consumed this book already. You know, you've gone through it and you've you've gone past it. Ridley Scott needs to go and check some of these other, these, you yeah. know, he needs to move beyond Chariots of the Gods, I think. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say that I dislike Prometheus or Covenant because I'm actually a really big fan of both of those movies. Um, but uh, but the that's, ancient that's the theory. charm of the new Blade Runner is that it it asks new questions and it isn't asking yeah. old questions the same uh, in a in a new way. It's it's a completely unique look, which is a lot of the strength of all of these newer um, uh, streaming shows. Sci-fi sci is like really having a kind of a rebirth right now. We're in the middle of a good sci-fi mm -hmm. rebirth where. Westworld is asking all kinds of cool new questions. Mm -hmm. Every few episodes, you're getting some new questions, and like, wow, you know, I never thought of that. Um, so, you know, to have a, a Blade Runner movie do that, just dream come true. Totally cool. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I am obsessed with androids, but often find myself frustrated that we hear the same questions over and over again mm -hmm. um that yeah so you have you know the robot who just wants to be real <sighs> please come on we've done this you know going back to pinocchio himself at like, pinicchio actually the orville recently <laughs> had a great episode 
where um, it was there was a there's an android character on the show uh, Isaac, perfectly named, and he operates exactly like an AI would. So he's sort of the data of the show. But data, I mean, again, made in a in an analog age. Mm. It, mm. <laughs> they didn't understand how AI worked, and so every bloody episode, data is. <laughs> He's showing an emotion, but he's like, I don't have emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Silly robot. Yes, you do. You had them all along, and we could all... T- all right, never mind. <laughs> no, you need some emotion. Yes! <laughs> I always remember that part from the trailer. Sorry. <laughs> but I think Alien Covenant does ask new questions as well and goes in a very strange new direction, which uh, I love. <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, David is, he doesn't want to be human, never wanted to be human, but he wanted to be, uh, he wanted to have agency and be seen as a person. So that's interesting as well. It, he doesn't want, he looks down on humans. He thinks they're inferior. Kind of like the way um, Batty did. Yeah. And I think Kay almost, he, he's the opposite of David, where he seems to completely accept his lot in life. He doesn't rebel. Well, the only sort of rebellion or, or deviancy is um, he, he's following this mystery, which is kind of his job. He's a detective. Mm. Oh, are you waiting for a David impression? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that. Go for it. <laughs> oh, I don't know. What, I don't even know what to say right there. <laughs> Sorry. Something will come. I'll, I'll think of something. Let's, something about Ombudsman. <laughs> let's talk about the relationship <laughs> between. Um, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the relationship oh, between one. Joy and Kay and Deckard and Rachel and how they differ. Um, mm. Because I know that this was a, still very hotly debated in a lot of um, Blade Runner groups and, and even um, in alien groups in, in reference to Daniels and Walter. Uh, being able to have a relationship outside of being just master and servant. So, so what are your thoughts on this? So, well, in Rachel's case, she, well, we don't even know if Deckard is human or not. That's still up for debate, but, (laughs) um, yeah, well, Rachel was, wasn't a servant really. So, Mm -hmm. so that's, you know, they're on equal footing there, but yeah, with joy, I yeah I would never consider a relationship with her real. She's I'm hurt. very. She, she's, I mean, <laughs> very lifelike and very convincing. But mm. ultimately, she just what everything she does is for Kate. All she cares about is is pleasing him, mm. and that's fascinating to me. Uh, and I've actually. I've got a very loose notes for an Android novel that I want to write. I mean, I know I can do the Android part, but just I need a plot. Because mm. uh, there's so much to be said about these sorts of characters. But mm. I think, yeah, no matter what, in the end, she would do whatever just to make you happy. It, it would never come from her own desires or spontaneity. Mm. Yes, that's true. That's true. It's kind of like the whole thing where, uh, at least in relation to, to, to God and, and Lucifer, he uh, gave Lucifer free will and he decided to use that free will to rebel. Then why did he did go and give that free will to the human race as well? You know, it's, it's not real love unless they love you of their own accord, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's this really interesting thing. So depending on how you interpret it, like uh, Milton, Dante, and the Bible itself have conflicting stories about this, but it's that <laughs> the and well, the the angels are kind of like androids. They don't have free will usually. Um, you know, they're just made to be the perfect servants. They're flawless, and then God creates humans. And he says to his angels, hey, look, this is your little brother and sister. And the angel's like, the fuck? What is, okay. Um, And human beings are flawed and and all that, but they don't have free will or knowledge. Mm. 
uh, until obviously uh, they they bite into the apple. But then some interpretations say, no, 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 they could make choices. And that's how they made the choice to bite the apple in the first place. So that's a rabbit hole for another day. But uh, (laughs) actually, I could probably work that into Prometheus by a minute. But that whole definitely free will discussion like uh, lucifer and the fallen angels actually wanted to teach the humans and they yeah as as you're saying just the idea of well it's not real love if you're just forcing these creatures to worship you and so uh, there was one demon who or fallen angel who taught the humans about um cosmetics apparently that's in the bible <laughs> oh, really <laughs> Wish I could remember the name of that particular one. I mean, is it, it's is it probably Samael? Maybe. I mean, they all end with E L, don't they? Yeah, Samael. Yeah, he Samael. Is, Samael is very Samuel much like um, very much like David eight, in the fact that yeah. he uh, had the gift of uh, music and creativity and stuff like that. So. That could be it. Also, yes, yeah, Samael in the Hellboy movie. I don't know why they use that name. I don't know if that they're implying that. Is the actual demon? It or... couldn't be. No. It couldn't be. Because that's just in it's Hellboy, a possibly like cosmetics and Samuel. That's <laughs> I, I don't think so. Something doesn't add up there. God, that's a great design, though. <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty cool design, huh? I thought that was a pretty. That was fun. I liked the Samuel thing. Guillermo always has the coolest creatures. I would still love oh, to see he, an alien movie by him. Oh, and he's doing scary stories to tell in the dark now. Did yeah. you guys hear about that? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah he's, he's doing, doing a, scary, a, scary a series. Scary stories to tell in the dark. Because those books, just the covers, or and then the interior art, it's just upsetting. Oh, yeah. In, in like, the most wonderful way. Oh, I love those. And he's, <laughs> yeah, he's look used it up. nothing but practical effects as well, with, of course, like, digital overlays, but they're, they're really great. Um... I am people so were commenting on effects. people were commenting on Twitter. Oh, that looks shit. It's it's um, CG, and he's like, no, actually, that's all practical. <laughs> yeah, that happened with Prometheus as well. Yeah. Oh, that was a car engine. <laughs> that was very loud. <laughs> yeah, right outside my window. <laughs> Sorry. What sort of um? He's supposed to be at work today. I don't know why he came back. <laughs> oh, well. he's gone now. <laughs> what was your favorite piece of technology that was introduced in twenty forty nine? Hmm. I would say I... for me, joy, because I love joy. <laughs> yeah, joy is probably the. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all about the AI. I just want. I didn't want to go for the most obvious answer uh i i'm not one of those people who's into the hover cars i i wow well, probably because i don't drive but i don't think we need them that'd be cool if there was like a smaller wheelchair version just you know yes or scooter version that'd be cool <laughs> it'd be a bit like tron though don't you think yeah i well in tron the I think they have to. Fo- oh no, the the recognizers can move freely, but there's the solar sailor which just moves on a, a light path. So, mm. yeah, I'm. No one cares, Connor. <laughs> I care. Oh, <laughs> that is a franchise that I my I put my entire heart and soul into, and then they got the rights to Star Wars, so then Legacy got thrown into the dumpster. Yeah, I'm so disappointed about that. I thought it was a good movie. Well, maybe someday, man. Maybe they'll bring. Maybe they'll like bridge the Big Lebowski universe and the Tron universe, <laughs> and they'll have like, like a Jeff Bridges impression for a second. Then, <laughs> well, yeah, man. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what the hell, Walter? <laughs> dude, dude, dude. I can get you a joke. Sorry, dudes. <laughs> Len- Lennon, Lennon, like John Lennon. Oh, I can do John Lennon. Yeah. No, no, no! When in, uh, Steve Buscemi he's sitting in the back, and they're talking about Lenin. And then, oh yeah, uh, John like, Lennon. I, yeah, you talk about the Beatles. Like no, no you're like a kid it walks <laughs> in on his parents watching a movie halfway through. <laughs> oh, right. Those three that. together were absolute gold. Oh my god, be costing. But um, bring Donnie back. <laughs> yeah, Tron anyway. talks about those same issues. Um, 
that Prometheus and, and all that uh, do that sort of... It, it is Paradise Lost. That story is essentially... You've got... Well, it's nice to have that change of a benevolent creator, you know, that Kevin Flynn mm. just wanted to create this really cool virtual world and he, you know, gave Clue the job of, you know, make it the best it can be. But if you give AI a vague job like that it's going to keep doing that to whatever extreme um and i think david is the same in covenant that his last orders were try harder so he did because no one told him to stop (laughs) yeah and no one can tell him to stop Hmm. I I just imagine you know the ghost of wayland uh, shows up and it just, just sees what David's been up to. It's like, you proud father's like, what the f- <laughs> <laughs> What do you think you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you talk again, I'll, I'll shoot, shoot you. you. I've got to put that on my Ghost of Wayland blog, which I haven't touched in a very long time. Oh, I missed that blog. Oh. It's so funny. Yeah, because there's nothing in the news. Cause I, I look at a, you know technology and AI in the news. There's nothing that I can make some good goofs on. Nothing for good riffs. It's been uh, quiet. I'll for, have a look oh. around. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> or make a request or something. <laughs> I need to... What is this Ghost of Wayland? I haven't seen this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah uh... Share that in the chat, Connor. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Tumblr, which now that they've deleted all the porn, is very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that just porn. about all of my photos got flagged, but that's because they're all xenomorphs and eviscerated bodies of Elizabeth Shaw? <laughs> Jeez. Mm. I mean, technically, they the big penis for a head, so. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, what else? <laughs> it's more because it's all controlled by AI. And they're not very discerning, or they're too discerning because they're all like David. They're like, uh, "That's mine." <laughs> exactly. That's my property. I'm uh, putting the link to my blog in the um, Twitch chat, and of course, I have to click. Are you a robot? And I'm just, I'm stuck here, guys. I uh... <laughs> sorry, can't post it now. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing it, whatever it is. Huh? Deleted link. What? what? Oh, it might be under my permissions. Hold on a sec. Well, I'll put it in our chat anyway. Yeah, put it in our chat and I'll share it. Should put it to Facebook. God, this is too many, too many things. <laughs> this is my favorite part of this discussion. <laughs> Where everyone gets distracted by social media. <laughs> totally. Oh, sorry. But back on back on to no, no, no. Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I I believe that the love between Joy and Kay is very real. Uh, for the mm. simple fact that she was created to love him. Uh, that's her job, and it doesn't mean that her love is any less different from human love. Uh, but mm. I believe that if you fell in love with Joy, then that love couldn't possibly be real because it's not real in the sense that human love, you have to love a person even though they're flawed or even mm. though, you know, some aspects of their characteristics clash with yours. So I feel like um, love is a lot bigger when it comes to uh, human to human love. Um, but yeah, I still believe that the love that Joy feels for Kay is real. And that, and it's, it's kind of like the same as like, I always bring this up, um, David in that movie, AI, artificial intelligence, he Mm. is a child created to love his parents. And just because he's artificial doesn't mean he loves his parents any less. And that love doesn't fade. Uh, it's eternal and it's kind of very sad. You, You kind of see it from his point of view that that's, that's his whole life that's his whole meaning and Mm. when when it's no longer needed he can't just stop you'd have to turn him off or kill him you know um yeah yeah it's i was made to serve (laughs) it is a really interesting philosophical question that doesn't have 
an immediate or definite answer, and that's well, you know what, what science fiction is so good at. My idea of this is that it is an infinite regress because it's the love is programmed, yes, but it is real love. Because in every regress that you have, the love exists. Whether it's real or false, it's always there. It's never not there. Mm. And each time you regress to, yes, it's real, no, it's not real, whatever, it's always there. It's not a non-entity. So I would say it's an actual thing. It exists, programmed or not. It comes back to, well, I subscribe to the determinism theory of the world that it, there is no free will. Nothing just happens at random. There's always causality, uh, you know, even down to, like, there. there's so many cases that they've done studies on where, like, um, people are let out on bail. They're more likely to be let out or the sentences will be less severe if they are put before a judge after the or yeah around a meal time just after they've eaten mm. because then they're able to concentrate better and, and all that sort of stuff and they're in a better mood um, and well if they're eating just a, the standard diet that their insulin spikes so they're like feeling fantastic for, for a little while um, so that's yeah the judge thinks they are making their own decisions no they're not it's just because they're not hungry <laughs> which is a scary <laughs> thought and even uh, you know when we feel certain ways or if we feel towards a certain way towards someone it could even have something to do with the temperature of the room when you met someone like oh <laughs> No, uh, I found that person so irritating. Was it, were they irritating, or was it because the air conditioning was broken, and you were just too hot and you're irritable anyway? So, or oh, I'm I feel so tired. It must have been because of this, that, and the other. It's like now your electrolytes are just low, and you you just you're not aware of these variables. And so, mm -hmm. you the more you delve into it, you realize human beings are just robots as well. We're 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 le leaky, slimy, moist, <laughs> squishy robots, but we are robots nonetheless. Computing machines. Yeah. Yeah. That's and... next level. Oh my god, you just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> Well the, what one of the scenes that and and this is something that was brought up um recently in, in uh one of the Facebook groups. I think it was Fields of Calantha, which is a, a, a branch of um, a Shoulder of Orion uh, Blade Runner podcast. Hello, guys. Um, they mentioned, or a, a member mentioned the fact that um, when Joy, uh, the the large pink digital Joy is interacting with uh, Kay, at that point, uh, do you think that he realizes that his Joy was all a lie? And that, in fact, the reason why he goes to fight for Deckard's daughter is the fact that he wants to fight for real love and not for the fake manufactured love that he was presented with. Yeah, definitely. It's it, it is in that moment. I mean, this movie is so great because it doesn't oversell things. Like in that moment, he could have mm -hmm. been like, Ugh. "Oh my!" Like take talking out loud to himself because so many characters in movies do that and go, "Oh no, it was all a lie." But no, he just looks up at her and he has this very unreadable or very conflicted expression on his face and I to me I read that as oh you're just you're the same you're just another one of this product and kind of realizing that's the same for me too I'm not really real um, so yeah it was definitely an inversion of those themes in the original Blade Runner, where I, it's absolutely, without a doubt, you know, that Roy and Pris and all of that, they're alive, but this cruel society can't see that. Whereas the lines are really blurred in 2049, and to deny Kay his humanity is kind of a, up for debate. Is, is that the right thing? Is that normal? Is that... What, 
how alive is a replica I, I definitely walked away from 2049 with more of those questions than the first blade runner plays it pretty straight it, yeah. you absolutely sympathize with the replicants and of course there's sympathy for the replicants in 2049 but there's so much more maybe so much less there's so much they're different they're this other creature and all the the actors do a great job of i think all of ridley's androids non-humans whatever you want to call them are so well acted from ash to david walter k joy all of them there's something missing and i'm really drawn to that and as an autistic person i definitely pick up on that and respond to that quite strongly because mm -hmm. I'm almost human. Like the, I don't want to make it a therapy session, but just even the way my parents would respond to me versus how they responded to my younger siblings, mm. there's this difficulty of connection. There's this, there's the, the, that real lack of intimacy, and there's this, there, there's an otherness that they just couldn't handle and something that I can't change about myself although I work at it you know I, 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 can, I can definitely be uh, social I, I have that programming now but uh, <laughs> there is human beings don't like that uncanny valley and mm. when they're around it, something that doesn't neatly fit into one category or the other they freak out even mm. on a subconscious level mm. no it's true it's so true and actually um yeah, I have a lot of difficulty with that myself being in a, a new place with like lots of different people and um, you know uh, Seattle's turned into a place where it's populated by tons of people from tons of different places you know it's a little bit more of a major city now so you get a little bit more of a New York vibe or mm. Chicago vibe or whatever mm. uh, maybe a little less Chicago but um, and yeah uh, places where people you know they they outwardly reject fitting into neat little boxes but the way they act and respond to social stimuli is very inside the box like mm. inside a box inside of a box inside of a box <laughs> and that is really irritating to me because i came here to fly my freak flag <laughs> and uh i'm finding it just equally difficult um as as it was back home in a lot of ways and you're you're very very right about that connor i think and it's uh you know as open-minded as people like to think they are i don't know i question it you a lot you see that a lot in disability advocacy where people in theory go well i care about you know i would never be cruel to a disabled person or you know uh, whether it's you know down <laughs> syndrome autism or even physical disabilities i can i uh had to oh, i was in a wheelchair for a little while there because of chronic fatigue and even yeah. that people treated me differently there was totally. all there's, a, it, there's either that paternalism and that sort of condescension or they just don't want to deal with it they just they avoid you they don't want to look at you um and especially with invisible disabilities like autism uh, like the other day, there was a boy who, I, he might have had Down syndrome, I don't know what, what it was, but we were in an elevator together and he was like babbling away excitedly about, I, he had like, it looked like he had a cut on his finger or something, uh, and then he went to touch me and I jumped back because I, I don't like being touched and especially, you know, I, I don't know if it's an, I could get infected, whatever, like that, no, I'm not okay with that. but. I, I knew when I got out of because the, there were two other people in there. There was his caretaker and this other guy. And I knew that the two neurotypicals probably looked at me like, oh, he's an asshole. Oh, he's so mean to this disabled kid. I'm like, but I'm disabled too. And I was freaking out because of my disability. And yeah, it, it, you, I definitely relate to replicants and androids in that way that I'm just doing my thing, and yet people can't handle it because mm. it's wrong somehow. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people That's respond differently to, to stimuli, and, and even, 
just just for example um the the replicants in the marketplace who are obviously working for the resistance and the way that they kind of um, interacted with k and the way that they treated him just because of his job you know you mm. know he's a blade runner and it's like oh, i don't want to talk to him <laughs> fine whatever you can go <laughs> Um, is resistance, resistance ever mentioned in the movie itself, or is that just in? The, it was mentioned uh, in the movie. Yeah. Right, I always think it's just in the short film. The no, no, uh, t- toward the end, they they actually meet the resistance. Oh yeah, yeah. When the, the woman with the one eye, right? I've totally blanked out on that subplot. Hold on, cut off. I feel like it's a bit that I didn't like. That, that yeah, was it's kind of like. This is going to be the next movie, huh? Huh? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it was a bit too heavy-handed. Like, you've got the Resistance in Star Wars, and then you in Detroit as well, there's the Deviants, and they've got Jericho, and that's the, you know, they're fighting against the system, and I just go, yeah, that's... I mean, it, it makes sense, but could we just focus on the plot at hand? <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. Nowadays, even movies have to tie into something even if it's just tying into more movies it's the whole reason they make anything anymore they they don't make they rarely make movies to make one movie anymore they make franchises yeah Yeah. and that's what they make totally what they're doing with blade runner (laughs) but this movie again going back to the previous conversation absolutely has a reason to exist and if they do more you know i'm actually on board now i would love to see a third one (laughs) <laughs> hopefully not that long because this one was really good if they could do if they could do this again if they could replicate the quality you know, <laughs> story wise um you know maybe even tell a smaller story uh you know get out of the city but and and you know go off world or something like that get get to a new setting that's a little bit more foreign um i feel like they're gonna touch on that on the animated series that's gonna come out supposedly oh, yeah, sometime this year so so yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting because have, have you guys read the comic book for Blade Runner? They did a comic no. book version of the movie. Yeah, um, of the movie um, or of the twenty forty nine? Of twenty forty nine. No way. Who did that? Titan. Uh, let me find it. <laughs> it might be IDW, Dark Horse. I don't know who it would be. Oh, just have to check the door of the art. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna have to check that out. I'm I'm interested to see who did the artwork for it. So I'll just paste the link into Titan Comics. Yeah, they're doing Blade Runner. So huh. I'll paste that into the chat. That's already so, out? Um, let's have a look. Oh, I see. It's a sequel yeah. to the to the film. Yeah. Okay. I think it's already out right. because I've seen the cover. Like I just, uh, I've, I've got a really massive backlog when it comes to um, my Amazon Kindle. So I apologize that I'm not <laughs> nah. up to date with everything yet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the comic books and, and novels will continue the story. And, and so would this animated series. And it'd be interesting to see how canon uh, all of this extended universe stuff is because I know that with at least with Alien they're trying to tie in the comics and the games and um, the novels together um, yeah, so I don't know rather problematic yeah exactly it's it's really hard to <laughs> tie so many things together and, and have someone uh, across the whole thing well, Blade Runner they're doing a really good job when you go back and look through the timeline of everything now the newly established timeline connecting the two movies and everything they, it's it's down solid. They have a rock, like a bulletproof timeline. I don't see any discrepancies. I mean, getting rid of uh, you know Replicant Knight and uh, Edge of Human. Uh, if you don't count those, it's bulletproof. It's really really nicely done. Actually, they they went into this knowing they wanted to build something. So, what sort or you of, can tell they did. What sort of themes would you like to see carried on in the animated series that's coming out this year? I think it should. They should be looking at what anxieties we have here and now, and focus on those. I think that's what makes something like Black Mirror so popular. Mm-hmm. 
is because it's talking about issues that we are thinking about either in our present or in the very near future. So, yeah, I th- I don't I don't want it to go in the direction of you know the the androids rise up or the replicants you know they have a resistance and there's like a war or something and uh no no I actually like exploring actually the first season of humans did that as well where it wasn't about the the androids rebelling or coming to life or I that bores the shit out of me I I like characters <laughs> like Kay or like Walter who just do their job or uh, Isaac in the Orville I just want a robot robot is that so hard to ask for <laughs> well you know I mean I see where you're going with that as far as as resisting the <laughs> resisting the resistance idea <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know I'm I'm game for anything as long as it's a platform for good storytelling as long as they use it to dramatic effect to narrative effect that's all that matters I you know like Star Wars you think, yeah, Star Wars, it's going to be a bunch of crap, and you go in, and it's it's exactly what the title says. But you know, you get it's it's a platform for telling the story of this farm boy and everything, and mm-hmm. his father, and you know, his fall from you know from being this special you know one in a million, one billion trillion people to a, the complete polar opposite, one in a billion million trillion people, you know. Uh, and redemption and all this stuff and it tells a really great personal story in the middle of this huge universe with tons of characters and spaceships and technology and aliens and war going on and action you still have this central spine through everything and you know, as long as as long as it's used for you know a, a dance floor for the story to dance on and you got something worth telling you know I'm all for it like Bring, yeah. send in the clowns. I don't care, <laughs> you know, like whatever. I but, think uh, that um, a lot of yeah. the stories as well they all serve as a metaphor for things that are happening in our world today: uh, political mm-hmm. climate, um, human rights abuses, uh, the impending war, um, our struggle with technology, and all of those sorts of things. So, I think in a way that struggle to become human really kind of represents the struggle to become better humans or better selves. <laughs> See, I want to flip that <laughs> on its head. Like, and I think Westworld does this and Sam Harris, uh, in one of his podcasts, but he also wrote an article, I think that we've linked to in uh, another Sam episode. Harris. Of uh, my boy, Sam Harris. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah, he was talking about how, like, for example, Westworld, it's not a question of are the androids feeling or should we feel bad about hurting them, but what does it say about us as human beings that we want to do that? We pay a lot of money Mm. to hurt and, like, rape and and torture and, and murder these things that are made to be, in every sense of the word, human, or at least on the exterior. And so that's where I want Blade Runner to go is not yes. ask, you know, uh, what what are, you know, the replicants are uprising because they deserve the same rights and all that. No, what's a, what kind of society do you build when you have a slave class that you manufacture, that you have actually sort of hacked into the human genome with such precision that you're just... 3D printing humans at this point. What does that do to society? That's what I want to see. I'm less concerned about the replicants themselves. Mm. Ask Master Cypher Diaz. Cypher Diaz? Oh, yeah. Episode 2, I thought. All right, everyone. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it rang a bell. That's why I was going, hang on. That's, yeah, Count Dooku. Jedi Master Cypher Diaz. (laughs) (laughs) We were beginning to think you were incoming. I need to stop it with this crap. Sorry. I'm not contributing Sorry. anything. It's uh, so good. You're contributing in anyway, a way. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I should probably wrap this up soon. So, um, yeah, do, do we have any other uh, questions about Blade Runner or, or bits of news information? Um, I, oh, yep, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go. 
I was un, I was unclear on this because I was talking. Uh, my dad's a huge Blade Runner fan. He got me into it. Blah blah blah. I've told that story already. Um, and we were talking because uh, we're working on, like I said, we're working on a little Blade Runner short together. And oh, nice. um, yeah, and he read it as K was dying at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Is K dying at the end? Yeah. Yeah, I think he got shot or something. Yeah, it was a Is reference to... Is that why? Because to, of the fight and everything? It was a reference to that scene in Cowboy Bebop. Um, oh, where, yeah. No way, really? Yeah. It's, f- oh. like, shot for shot, it's exactly the same. Um, oh, man. What? It's so cool. Yeah, so if you... Why would they do that? Because, because the guy who did the animation also... Uh, did the animated Blade Runner shot, and it's a parallel in the story. Cross pollination. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go into it more because I don't want to spoil it too much. But it's, it's kind of giving me gas. It's about it's about dying for a cause, um, basically. Mm. Yeah, just the mm. very rough outline of it. <laughs> yeah, I okay. like that. K's ending, you know, they've. I think in lesser hands it would have just been another Tears in the Rain, you know, just doing the exact oh, same thing. Yeah. But instead, K, yeah, dies for a cause that he believes is greater than himself. He's a very selfless character. He's not. Yeah, like the idea of. Yeah, because Roy Batty is re- very selfish in the fact that he goes, I want more life. I want it for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. But he's and- Roy Batty. <laughs> Love Roy, but but yeah, it was very uh, selfish, and and um, K is very yeah, you're right. He's very selfless. Yeah, he, uh, he, but he it gave makes it all sense up. for their lifespans because the 2049 androids, uh, androids, replicants don't have a limited lifespan. Mm. Am I remembering that yeah, right? Open-ended. Yeah, open-ended. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, yeah, if you are only three years old, of course you you haven't had that time to really think about. Uh, or just have the room for maturity and to think of others. Mm, mm. That's true. Yeah, yeah. He's, they're, he's they're just toddlers. a child. And toddlers only care about themselves. <laughs> that's true. Before. I've got one. <laughs> Strange obsessions. <laughs> like a child. Yeah. Exactly. Like a toddler. Strange obsessions. I have a question for you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, what? What's your take on the soundtrack, the score for the film? It's yeah, I that was something I was concerned about when they announced the sequel. Going well, how are you going to top the original soundtrack? Are they going to do the same thing? Are they getting um, Vangelis? Vangelis. Back again? Mm. Is Vangelis Van? Um, Van. Um, yeah, <laughs> and then uh, they were saying it was Hans Zimmer. And going, oh God, really? Again? Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's bloody Hans Z's and everything. But no. They delivered something that was equal, if not in some ways superior, and oh. it, it's ambient, and, and, but it's also epic as well, and yeah, it definitely stands up, but stands apart from the original. Mm. I'll take that. What do you think, Clara? Uh, I, I really love, because you know that I only just recently watched... Uh, Blade Runner, and then watch Blade Runner sure. 2049. So, so for me, I really love the sound and and how uh, how larger than life the Blade Runner 2049 soundtrack uh, sounds like. If you put it on speakers and full ball volume in your house, mm. the windows mm. just they tremble. You know what I mean? Uh, Subsonics, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and with. Uh, the original Blade Runner soundtrack, I felt like uh, it's it's good, it's really good, but it's just it doesn't move me in the same way. And and because it's, it's there's no, no nostalgia talking there, um, maybe it's it's a product of the time. Uh, I, I think a lot in a lot of places, the sounds are very timeless, and I've heard a lot of other uh, soundtracks or musicians reference stuff from it. Yeah. Um, and in that case, it's very it shapes the music that we listen to these days. But uh, twenty forty nine really did sound like it was from the future. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I can. It's this real weird combination of things. That's what Hans Zimmer is good at. He's good at well the big loud um, 
orchestral stuff as well, but finding those very odd instruments and sounds. Um, the other thing is I only tend to listen to the original Blade Runner soundtrack on a rainy day. It is absolutely gorgeous. You know, if it's, it's overcast, <laughs> it's raining, you know, yep. if you're on the bus or whatever, just looking out, it's especially good if you're looking out a window and the, and the, the rain's hitting the glass. Whereas 2049, I can listen to pretty much whenever. Mm. Yeah. Also, holy shit, the Alien Covenant soundtrack, it's, it's terrifying. I just want to, uh, speaking of soundtracks that came around, out around the same time. Fuck. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, I am, things, when it, when it comes to music, it, I need themes. I need melodies. Mm. The new soundtrack felt like soundscapes to me there was there was almost yeah. there wasn't one melody in there and i'm like anybody could have done this why would you pay hans zimmer like multiple millions of dollars or whatever you paid him to like put his finger down on one note and then like put his finger down on another note and then <laughs> have somebody go like oh, i like that, then, like, pitch that. i was like stuff. no i mean it's it's great but it's kind of like Where's the music? Well, have have you it's seen not music. the NBC it's Hannibal? I'm sorry. The, have you seen the NBC Hannibal? No, I haven't. No. Because the soundtrack for that is again this th- those surreal uh, soundscapes. Absolutely, I think you're you're absolutely right that the it's more soundscape and sure. ambient than conventional music, and definitely not a conventional soundtrack, especially the ones that come out these days. Um, and I, I really like that because I, I think it forces my brain to try to pick out patterns that aren't there. It's always trying to yeah, find order in the chaos. And I quite like that exercise, but it's not for everyone. I, I definitely admit to sure. that. Sure. And no, and I trust me, I'm, I'm really into um, alternative uh, styles and methods of music and listening. Mm. Uh, I've gone through everything and I've come back around to just the Beatles again. Um, and I have gone through everything. Trust me, like really awful experimental stuff. And just, you know, whatever. Trust me, I'm not bragging by saying that either. Um, I'm just saying, uh, you know, I feel like, yes, you want, you want uh, kind of a sound bed, especially for a film like this. It's good. It helps. You have it helps with the scope of the film i think you know mm. but you had this really high quality soundtrack for the original blade runner and i'm not just talking about the tools that they used to make the music i'm not talking about that at all cuz that's the dated part of the music it's the sounds they used it's the composition the actual melodies not just anybody can do that mm. yeah um and it was that was raw talent that was vangelis really coming alive with that music and connecting with the film and its narrative. Uh, and you listen to that music and you're there. You go there temporarily. When I listened to 2049 soundtrack, I've listened to it twice and I was just like, I can't pick one piece of music out from another. And, you know, like, I'm not saying I need like this orchestral theme for every single character or scene or anything, but God have some content. You know, like, and then they drop in, you know, you have the original film where they had One More Kiss, Dear, which was written for the film. Mm. The new one has Elvis and (laughs) Sinatra. And I'm like, can you give people a little bit more credit than that? You know, I mean, that's not the only old music there is. And generate something for the film that's that's musically entertaining. I don't know. I found that really irritating. I, I thought it was really skimping on the the potential that you have for this film. Get somebody who's like who is going to compose something. You know, mm-hmm. don't just have somebody come in and do soundscapes. We've been waiting for this film for thirty odd years. Uh, but you know? um, speaking of of Elvis and all that, that would be really interesting if they yeah got a composer to make this alternate past so instead of musicians we know they actually make up a false 
a musician or singer from the 1950s so really you know, making a song in that style but then you go oh that that's not a real singer so then it sort of implies wow this this reality diverged a long time ago yeah, yeah. it was it, it, in in my mind it just ties into the real world in such a commercial way it, um, it, it really blared in that film because I wasn't expecting to see Elvis in Blade Runner. I wasn't expecting mm. to see Frank Sinatra turn up in Blade Runner. I was extremely disappointed with that. That felt like such a studio decision to me where they were like, no, no, no. This is this is the musical part of the movie. we got to tie this into something. I'm like, do well, you really have to do that? It's freaking Blade Runner. you got Harrison I just Ford say, and everybody right here. S- someone had brought up... Uh, Angry Blue Planet on Twitter, Dave. Um, I, I chat to him a lot, and uh, he brought up the fact that Sinatra was included in Blade Runner twenty forty nine as a homage to the l- late Bud Yorkin, who was a producer on Blade Runner, because Yorkin uh. directed Sinatra um, in the film Come Blow Your Horn. So that was his direct- directorial debut. So I think there are kind of meanings that other fans may not be aware of. Uh, I wasn't aware of this either because I thought it was really weird seeing Sinatra um, in the film myself until this one was brought up and I was like, oh, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, I like... can hear Sinatra right now saying, <laughs> suck it, Hyperdyne. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's just interesting, these little uh, facts that some people may not be aware of and, and that kind of uh, influence... Producers' decisions, writers' decisions, directors' decisions mm. on including them in the film. I, I don't know the intention of including um, Elvis in the the whole scene of Las Vegas. Maybe it's because it was a time where I mean, everyone could relate Vegas to Vegas and everything. But yeah, yeah. but you know, if but I find out anything, thing. I'll share I'm it. Like, <laughs> I just I, I don't know. Hand. It 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 killed too much of the fiction for me. You know, it uh, and it, it felt like a commercial decision. It felt like, all right, we can put this on the soundtrack. And, you know, uh, Deckard has a funny moment where they stop fighting. And he goes, I like this song. Yeah, I thought that was that was kind of great. Like that that made it OK for a minute for me. But I was like, and then they bring him back again. Like, come on. Like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm I get <laughs> really picky about music choices with film. It's OK. Um, okay. It's understandable. Especially Blade Runner. It's like so precious to me. <laughs> so, yes, it's, it's been a, a nice chat. I think we've had a lot of observations, but I must leave you, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's okay. No. I, <laughs> I, I'm going to have to go too because I've got to go pick up my daughter from school. It's so weird. She's started school now and uh, I've got to pick her up at two. But uh, we'll definitely uh, connect together again. And chat. I was hoping yeah, on. Great. I mean, I'm going to stick around and I'll just talk to myself. As well. <laughs> oh, I, I can talk to you about um, <laughs> the. Well, well, let's let's wrap up this 2049 stuff. But I would like to continue to talk about um, the the new mention by James Cameron, Blomkamp, and Alien Five. Uh, if you want to oh, quickly yeah. mention anything, Connor, about that. Um, I I don't want the Blomkamp version. <laughs> Okay. I have Me either. spoken at length about it in my podcasts. Um, <laughs> I just feel it's too fanfic and what I prefer is Ridley Scott just um, doing whatever the hell he wants and surprising me and doing some very weird shit. <laughs> Sounds good. 100% agreement here. I don't want to see Blomkamp's alien film. I do not believe in it. I don't care what Sigourney says or what James Cameron says. James Cameron says something is gangbusters. You know, I I really enjoy James Cameron. I'm not one of these haters of James Cameron, but I don't believe in a fifth movie with Ripley, especially if it's going to retcon. Yeah, like just just leave it. You know, we we already it's have dumb. enough of a mess with things. Yeah, I, let it go. I heard it, I heard it wasn't a, a retcon. A I think thing. it was a misinterpretation. So from what I have heard, it's mm. not a retcon. It's just visiting an alternate storyline it wasn't supposed to be connected to canon at all okay so everything else that's oh, even see. right up to resurrection now is still canon because wow, the, the books so follow it really the comics weird. follow it but that's why i think ridley didn't want uh it to come out yet because it would kind of 
mess would, with things. Yeah, it would, potentially it would, mess with things. It would, yeah, potentially mess with things. Um, but at the same time, I, I when I spoke to Tristan Jones about this, he said the Alien universe has kind of got to let go and let one-off movies be created um, to to kind of satisfy uh, the fan base and kind of like you know, for example, with the DC universe doing Birds of Prey and also, you know, doing all these other films that don't really connect to what they're doing now as a canon timeline. And kind or of just... uh, Star Wars is kind of doing like Rogue One and Han Solo yeah. just going all over the map. Yeah. I would be okay with that as long as we're getting a third Ridley Scott alien. 100% agreed. Yes. Yep. Totally agree as and, well. And like, <laughs> let Ripley be done. She's mm. done. We've had enough. You know, she died and you brought her back to life already. We don't need any more. Her story is complete. Yeah. I really don't see... It's going to be like the Terminator 